It is the eve of National Signing Day. We will discuss and other news and notes around Iowa football, of course, here on Hawkeyes Live right here at the Voice of College Football. Appreciate you stopping by. Leave those comments and questions in the chat. They most notably get recognized with a Super Chat contribution. Not that we won't answer other comments and questions, but if you want something to definitely be seen and heard, let us know in that manner. Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App as well. We appreciate you being here. We've done it 126 consecutive weeks. Thanks to this guy, Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Corey will be live with all of you on National Signing Day at 1.30 Central Time, 1.30 Central Time on Wednesday with Corey. So you are allowed to skip out on my live uh, festivities at 1.30 Central Time because basically I'm going to show up at nine in the morning and be hanging out all day is the plan. So we will get into that a little bit uh, later. Corey, how you doing? I'm doing good. It's actually one, 1 p.m. Central time. Oh, so I'll be, I'll be there at the top of the hour and um, got a number of Iowa athletes, a number that uh, we've not heard from uh, on the show. So if people want to hear from the, the kids that are signing tomorrow and making it official, um, this is the third straight year of of doing this. It takes quite a bit of organization and, um, I mean, just just a lot of uh, communication to get all of this, all the time slots filled, if you will. And then we have a, a basketball post game with Jess Settles later in the day after the uh, Maryland uh, UMBC Iowa game. So full day of streaming. It's always this week. Week is always uh, very very busy. UNBC, they are the club that knocked off number one Virginia, correct, a few years ago? They are. I think they're more fondly known as UMBC as opposed to Maryland-Baltimore County. So, uh, yeah, I don't think they're very good. I don't know uh, I don't know what that program has done since they beat Virginia, became the first 16 seed to win a game in the tournament. But good, that's a good memory, Mark. I'm being a basketball guy. I'm not a basketball guy. Uh, I do... Uh, find it interesting that there are a couple other schools out there that have become more well known and referenced by their acronym, and they've taken exception to that in some way. I've heard this about BYU, they don't like to be called Brigham Young. Well, what does BYU stand for? Uh, Texas Christian, TCU doesn't like to be called Texas Christian anymore. Well, what does TCU stand for? <laughs> I think that's really stupid. Who said they don't want to be referred to as BYU? I, I've heard this from a number of sources. Brigham? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. They're simply BYU now, and they're simply TCU. Well, what does that stand for? All right. Okay, Mark, how are you doing with your bull picks so far? A couple days in. I believe I'm three and three straight up. I'd okay. have to go look for sure. I uh, I forgot about yesterday's game. And I cannot forget about tonight's game. I need to make a, a prediction before tonight's game. But I picked all the games on Saturday. And then I completely forgot about that game yesterday. And so I did not pick that game. How are you doing? Well, I usually do pretty good on this. I'll, I'll be quite frank. I, I typically enjoy this time of year because I tend to do better with because I just have my kind of my formula, my system of, of re researching these different teams. And I don't normally take the time to do that during the season. I'm kind of just going based on what I'm seeing week to week. And so I take some time with these picks. I am uh, five and three right now. And, you know, you are what your record says you are. I ought to be seven and one. All right. And I'll tell you why. First of all, I picked Old Dominion yesterday. They were up 28 zero and they lose in overtime. This is what happens to me. This is what happens. We have 28 0. They lose in overtime. So that's one of my three losses. And then another one of my three losses was the, uh, let's see. Let me find the right game here. I'm on the Was wrong. it the New Orleans Bowl? I missed on that one. And yes, was it uh, Louisiana? Was up by a touchdown late in the game. Had yes. a fourth down. I missed How that one. As well. fourth down. All they had to do was get off the field on fourth down and they give up a touchdown. They give up an easy touchdown through the air. Uh, they were up in that game and should have won the game. So I look at it and I say, well, I should be seven and one. But I got I got confidence moving forward. We got, uh, let's see, tonight you have uh, UTSA and Marshall. So 
Um, the three most recent bowl seasons I can find, I can find a document for with my predictions. I went 23 and 13, 23 and 10, and 24 and 15. That's straight great. up. Those good, yeah, those are good numbers. Um, what was last year? What did you do last year? I, I can't find last year's. I'm, it's on Patreon. I could go find it. I'm just checking real quick. I'm curious to what I did last year. Last year, let's see. I was. Why doesn't it tell me? It says that I was a head of twenty. Let's see. Are you? Are you? Well, you're just looking at straight up picks. Um, yes. Stand by here. I know everybody wants to know this. Yeah, uh, this was, is like, why everyone tuned in tonight. Yep. I was 25 and 18 last year. So, um, five and 18. I should be able to find mine really soon here. I'm scouring through Patreon to find my post. Yeah, 25 and 18. And I'm trying to figure out where I was in 2021. Again, like you said, everybody else was, uh, this is why everybody tuned in. 55 people watching right now, all because we're talking about how many bowl picks we make, right? For well, they're going to have to hang in there for just a second because I got to do some quick addition. Uh, let's see. Oh, I picked Kentucky to beat Iowa. Okay. Um, hang on. Uh, two and two, two and three, three and three, four, three, five, three, add five and three onto 19 and nine. I went. 24 and 12. Oh, so you're not, you're missing some picks then you did. Yeah. I just forgot about games. Okay. Scattered games. I I've not been diligent at this the last couple of years. I used to just, the, my predictions used to just be front and center. So important to me. And I just kind of throw them out there now. So ha, I missed a number of games last year. Like I completely forgot. Okay. There's like five bowl games today. Oops, forgot to pick them kind of thing. So I did 36, 24 and 12. Yeah. Yeah. And I was 22 and 16 the year before that. So I always go through and make sure I, I always pick. Here's one thing I do. I go through and make my all my picks before all the games start. I don't, you know, because unfortunately what what's happened more here in the last year or two is you have, you know, player news, players opting out. Yes. You know, after the first game starts. And so that changes things. So I kind of just go, I can just roll with it. So you're crediting my record with making these picks last minute. And you're picking and choosing which ones you, you, which picks. Well, no, 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 I'm not picking and choosing. Oh. I have picked every bowl game for like 40 years <laughs> since well, like 20 no, years before you were alive. I was picking every bowl game, just one particular season. <laughs> I missed some bowl games. Well, you missed the one last night too. Yes, I did. I completely forgot there was a game. Anyways, how do you blow a 28 to nothing lead? Can you explain that to me. I didn't watch it, but you lose it. How do you blow a 28 to nothing lead? I thought you watched every bowl game. Oh, I can't, every bowl game. I mean, you've told me that a few times. That I, you I, watched I, I every bowl game. Watch. I think what I've said is I would like to watch every bowl game. Mm. I, I had intentions of watching the second half yesterday, and I just didn't get around to it, but. I watched a lot on Saturday. Yeah, I did. Uh, but I know better not to create any content around those level bowl games because nobody watches. Nobody cares. Isn't that something? Nobody. Like even you would think that like how many, for instance, if you did a video on UTSA and Marshall tonight, you, how, what percentage? I mean, like how many people, how many total fans from each school care about that game? It's got to be in the tens of thousands total, right? Yes, but are they going to be able to find my video? And then also, there's probably two, two and a half million people that are going to watch that game. Yeah, but some of those people are just, they're not going to sit down and watch a preview for that game. I'm just thinking of the invested people from each school. You know, bowl game, I would think, is a bigger deal for those smaller schools. And, and then I've also, in recent years, taken the approach that, okay, this game just concluded. Nobody cares about, you know, maybe they enjoyed watching the game, but in regards to it meaning anything to them, nothing. 
So I'm going to take the approach that we're we're going to make this a springboard as a preview. You know, who's sticking around? Yeah, that running back went off for 175 yards, but he's not going to be back next year kind of thing and do it as a springboard to the next season. Yeah, from what I remember, don't think anybody really cared about that either. <laughs> the Georgia Southern and Ohio Can I University. You- what would it take for you? I think this is what you, here's what I think you ought to do. <laughs> Here we go. I think you ought to. You, when does uh, South Dakota State play Montana? <laughs> you were asking the wrong person. Mark, Mark, it's the national. Just try it. It's a national championship game. One preview. Just do one. I'm assuming it's this weekend. Publish a preview. So, you can do enough research in a short amount of time. You saw in South Dakota State play Iowa last year. You probably have an idea of their roster. They got a different head coach because what? The, what the, you First saw? Of all, I did not watch one play of that game. Number you didn't watch? I, huh? No, I did not watch Iowa and South Dakota play. South Dakota State. South Dakota State. Jackrabbits. Yeah, I say I don't even know their nickname. So for me to do a preview would be completely fraudulent. But that's um, okay. It's okay if it's fraudulent one time. I want to know if it gets any traction. Do it, do it for the sake of doing it. I'd like to know if it's going to get any traction. If I have time. <laughs> what I may do, when is this game? I'm, I'm guessing you Saturday. were asking me. Yeah. yeah, I'm guessing it's Saturday. So that's going to run into bowl games that I would rather watch. But it, um, is, it is. Hold on a second. Let me let me find it here. Maybe I think actually not. if I watched the game and we did a post game. Maybe, maybe that will no, do I'm something. Sorry. It's. Wow. Okay. It's this says it's on January seventh. Oh, they just had the semifinals last week, so that's a long break before the national title game. Okay. Sunday, January seventh at two p.m. Eastern. Which is, oh, it's on during the NFL, and it's the day before the national championship game. The what national gotta, championship. What do you got to? What do you got to do? Go get a tan or something. Who cares if it's the day before the national championship game? What does that mean? People make will still be starved and craving analysis and preview. That's right. Videos for the national championship game. Oh, okay. The national championship game. I ran into a lot of dumb Michigan fans today. It was just incredible. Really? That doesn't yeah, seem. Speaking of the possible national championship game in which they would be possibly participating in. Not you saying that Michigan it. fans are by and large dumb. They just, I ran into sure. a lot of dumb ones. They comment to my channel a lot and they say really stupid things. <laughs> so before, we will get into Iowa. Uh, I will make this final comment. There was a guy who actually, so I posted a video today doing a complete stats analysis of Alabama versus Michigan. So for example, here's Michigan's rushing offense, yards per game, yards per play. Here's Bama's rush defense. And then also going deeper than that to say, these are the better rush defenses that Michigan faced. How did they fare against Iowa, Ohio State, Penn State? Here are the worst ones. they've. The whole deal, whole breakdown. Completely consistent, just, just complete stats breakdown. I cannot skew any of this information. I had a few people. You're choosing the worst stats for Michigan. You're making this bias. Do, do. How am I making this? <laughs> it's, it's... DDR256 says in the chat, I thought you were going to stop calling people dumb and morons. Oh, I erroneously <laughs> said that the other night. I was trying to go back and, and just be a better person. And I, I felt bad after I just completely <laughs> blasted a caller and told them what an idiot they were. <laughs> And then as soon as they got off, I said, I shouldn't call anybody an idiot, shouldn't call them a moron. I should just simply say what they are saying is idiotic, what what they are saying is moronic. Yes. You, you, thanks for calling me out, holding me accountable. I shouldn't I do that. A, I mean, that has nothing to do with, uh, you know, Michigan fans. I do think Bama's going to win that game. I could be wrong, but I have a feel I have Bama and Texas in the national championship game. Um, I don't know if that's what you've, those are the picks you've made, but. You've already made your picks, of course. I haven't. Yeah. So we'll get to those. Uh, yes, Iowa fans, you've been mighty patient for 15 minutes here. 
but I'll blame it on Corey. I think he started it. But I do think that we've got a really good topic uh, with uh, what Kirk Ferentz said um, about um, certain teams. And of course, he's talking about USC entering the Big Ten. And uh, let's see, I will go to the copy right here. So folks, if you have not seen this, um, he was caught where? Where was this? Was this at a after bowl practice? Or yeah, this was bowl bowl practice. And I, in fact, I wasn't. I, a, I wasn't there. B, I didn't see it until last night. So it's not like I was on the airwaves or re- reacting to this like some people were, uh, were. But he he just for context, he was asked about how much leeway and basically rope a new OC would get, and would they have to stick to his philosophy. <sighs> Big sigh in and out. Um, but he here's the deal. Um, we've known this, right? We've known he was going to stick to his philosophy. And I don't think it should discourage fans too much because I think I have been one to put a solid amount of blame on Brian Ferentz. A lot of people wanted to deflect that to or defer it over to Kirk for all these years, the last three years. I think the biggest problem with the offense like it or not, has been Brian Ferentz, has been the offensive play caller. I do. So it's not the only problem, but it's the biggest problem. They have proven, Iowa has proven they can win games, how Kirk Ferentz wants to win games, wants to win games, but with a better offense, with a more competent offense. They did that under uh, Ken O'Keefe. They did it under Greg Davis at times. You know, Ken O'Keefe had a higher ceiling, but we've only seen three offensive coordinators at Iowa under Kirk Ferentz. So the people, I can tell you this right now, the people who are up for the job, all of them are slam dunk hires compared to what we're coming off of. That, that's just a fact. So regardless of who Kirk settles on, it's going to be a plus. Would I love for them to go out and, you know, spread things out a bit more and try? Sure, right. But we, we've said for months, Mark, when this hat would happen, it was not going to be a total change in philosophy. And Kirk just reinforced that yesterday. And this is not simply to me about just throwing the football more. I think for a lot of fans, that's what it is. You got to throw the football more to score more points. I don't think that's it. I bet if we threw the stats up that although Iowa would be in the bottom 20 or 25 in the nation in pass attempts, probably there would be some, maybe not. I don't know. Maybe. And some of that's just because they've, they've lost time of possession so badly recently, but in general, like percentage pass versus run, you know, the ideal is that you can run probably a little bit more than you can pass, but you want it to be balanced. I mean, that's, I think most teams want that. Sure. Yes. All right. So in response to being asked about an offensive coordinator, Kirk said, quote, I'm really not worried about points per game. But what is important is wins per game. I think there's a guy that entered the conference recently that came with widely acclaimed offensive stats and all that. That's usually how those guys become well-known because of whatever they're doing. Throwing it, running it, wishbone. (laughs) But then you took a little, oh, I'm sorry. But then you look a little bit deeper. So that's what this guy's... So what's this guy's wins per game question mark? So I, I believe that was a shot at Scott Frost. If you're reading between the lines. Um, okay. I, I believe that's a shot at Scott Frost. So he, he kind of went after. And it's what's ironic about that is there was a rumor going around a week ago about Scott Frost potentially being a candidate. And right away I went on the air and said, that's totally false. He's not a candidate. There's no mutual interest. But there was that rumor out there that someone started. But anyways, I think that was a kind of a side swipe at Scott. Okay. All right. Got that. Not that you couldn't, in theory, be a really good offensive coordinator and not a very good head coach. And then he went on to say, there's usually a correlation. People who just throw the ball around, it makes it tougher to win. It makes it tougher to be good on defense. There's a school on the West Coast right now that's going to recommit to defense. They gave up 42 to Tulane last year in a bowl game at a place where Ronnie Lott played. 
Why does he have to see this? So now they're going to think about defense, you know? And that's obviously USC. They lost to Tulane uh, last year. However, they, they were a better team than Iowa last year, and Tulane was a better team than Iowa last year. Yeah. They, they were in a better bowl game, first of all. So, you know, if, if you want to bring up what happened this year and USC's failures, absolutely, that's fair. But I think the, the divide that we have, and this is why I'd love to be able to get Kirk in a one-on-one, -on -one, kind of an intimate interview where you can kind of sit down and talk through this a little bit more. Because the question that was brought up, I think it was Scott Docterman of The Athletic, basically asked Kirk, how again, how much philosophy change should we expect, if any? How much rope is, gonna, is the uh, new OC going to be allowed? And then Kirk went on the spiel. And that's kind of what ends up happening. You ask it kind of a generic question, and then he goes into the spiel about what he wants to talk about. So I don't really know. I know that I blame Kirk. He's been very consistent with his stance on this. I think it would be a better conversation to have have a ten minute conversation on this subject where there's back and forth. That's what I would like to hear. I, I just I'm almost over trying to draw some ridiculous conclusions about Kirk with comments like this. He's still very defensive of his son. He brought up how he still believes a coordinator should be evaluated by wins and losses. That is illogical. Okay. That is illogical. And I can, again, you ask any other major coordinator or major head coach in the country, I would say, I shouldn't say any, I would say 90% of head coaches or former head coaches would say they have not evaluated their coordinator on any given year based on did we win or did we lose? Now, Kirk is patterning this a different way than most head coaches because he's talking about this complimentary concept. But again, again, um, you know, I would have I, what I would have returned with is, OK, there, there are games where you can play this way, but but explain how you lose by a total of 57 to nothing against your only two top 25 foes on the schedule this year, 57 to nothing like that's. So is that a problem with the whole team? Are we really going to say the defense needed to do more in those games? You, you scored zero. But again, I, I just don't think that the those types of poolside interviews aren't really uh, great for that type of a back and forth. And I, I'm not trying to want to debate Kirk on it, but I just think it's a fair conversation to be had. There needs to be some logic brought up and I understand his stance. And there are some people, holy cow, there are some people who just, you go Kirk, I love you, man. <laughs> like, it's just like this, oh man, I love you so much. You've just, you've made me feel all warm and fuzzy inside again. And it's like, bro, like he's been here 24 years. I love that you love him, but let's, we can like, we don't have to be so polarized by this. We don't have to be a Kirk worshiper, but we also don't have to be a Kirk hater. I'm not a Kirk hater, but I, I believe he's got a blind spot with this. And I think some of that is still leftover remnants from his son's failures here. Cause he's never been this. He's never had to dig his heels in this much because the offense has never been this bad. That's the problem. So, the hope that I have, Mark, they're not going to overhaul the philosophy, but a couple of the candidates that, that are well-known out there, all right? One is, is Paul Christ. He is a candidate, okay? That is a fact. He is a candidate. He would be an upgrade. He's a former quarterback. He coached some good offenses at Wisconsin uh, as a coordinator before becoming the head coach years later. Andy Ludwig is another one that's been in the mix. Um, now the name escapes me, uh, Joe Philbin. Is also in the mix. He was the line of coach at Iowa. Then he won a Super Bowl as the OC at Green Bay. Was the head coach at, at Miami. Um, he's an O line guy. So who's coaching quarterbacks if he comes here? That's a question. You know, they promote Bud Meyer and get rid of someone else on the staff. Again, questions I, I don't, I don't have the answer to. Those are three of the four candidates at this point. Either way, any one of those three would be an upgrade. And based on what I've been told, the fourth would also be an upgrade, significant upgrade. I, I got to I'll be right back, Mark. I'll be right back. I've got great respect for Kirk Ferentz. Uh, he's done a tremendous job at Iowa, but he's not the perfect coach. He doesn't run the perfect program. There is room for criticism just because there is room for improvement and not just improvement. It's one thing to still need uh, to improve, but to be working on those 
items in those areas, but have not achieved it yet, it's another thing to kind of discard it. And that's what he's doing here. And I know he relies on this. It's all about winning. And of course it is. It is about winning. Now, if he was reeling off national championships, that would be one thing Then I would be completely throw my hands in the air and say, this formula is perfect. It's, it's, it's getting the job done completely. And again, he's, he's been a tremendous success and everything, but he's picking on a coach that actually has a better winning percentage, significantly better winning percentage than he does. So that's not a valid criticism that he's making. My biggest struggle with what was said yesterday was in regards to the comments. And I understand it. I understand why he said it, but he brought up how it's my belief. And it's been my belief for the last 24 years that the best way, our best chance of winning here is to play complimentary football. He really emphasized that here. And, you know, read into that as you, as you wish. I saw a brief clip and I shared it on Twitter this morning. John Fanta, who's a college basketball guy was talking to former Iowa basketball player, Jordan Bohannon about Fran McCaffrey and the Iowa basketball team. And he kind of alluded to the same thing about like how, well, Iowa fans really need to understand, like you're upset with Fran, but you're Iowa, like appreciate what you got here. Here's a guy who just sent Keegan Murray to the NBA. The dude dropped 12 threes the other day in an NBA game, scored 47 points. Luca Garza came out of Iowa. Chris Murray came out. Like look what Fran's doing and you're Iowa. I get so sick of that nonsense that I, I even I tweeted that out. I said, yep, we peasants here in Iowa need to just be appreciative for what we do get. The scraps that that were tossed, so to speak. I just think that's such a loser mindset. And by the way, John Fant is not an Iowa guy. He's just a college basketball guy. So who cares what he says? But that's the only issue I have. I understand that there are some disadvantages being Iowa. It's not USC. It's not Ohio State. It's not Bama. But I think you're selling the program a little bit short when you start talking about how you know, we not that Kirk ever said we can't win other ways, but to say we can't adjust our philosophy a bit to bring in better skill position players on offense, you know, perhaps opening things up, whatever that would look like. And hopefully they do that. And he's just not going to acknowledge it because they did that at times with previous OCs. Um, hopefully that's the case. But I, I just I don't like that peasantry type of mindset. We do our USC show on Monday nights and there was a comment made and I don't want to screw this up about where it came from and directed toward whom, but it was, it was directed toward the strength and conditioning coach. I know that. And so there is concern on the other side of this integration of styles of play and how this is going to look because USC, uh, there was a comment made, and again, I, I don't remember who made this comment, but it was involving USC, that they're not joining the mid-10. They're joining the big 10. You need to get bigger, stronger, and so their strength and conditioning program and coach is under fire to be more stout in the trenches. So I looked at uh, their first four or five games. They're really playing not necessarily the very best teams in the Big Ten, but a pretty good uh, run of physical teams. Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Penn State. I don't think that it's going to be obvious next year that, oh, these four teams are coming in and they're just amazing and they're just going to light it up and they are lighting it up, or that, oh, well, now they're playing big boy football. They can't handle it. I I think we're going to see some very competitive games and matchups. And I, I I don't think either one, either I hear it from both sides. I hear the PAC 12 homers say, Oh, the big 10 quarterbacking is horrible. There's no speed. We're going to run all over them. We're too fast. Da, 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 da. And then the big 10 about we're too tough. We're too physical. They can't play in the elements, all that. I don't think either one's true. I, I agree with you. And I, I, is USC on Iowa schedule next year? Or is it UCLA that, that plays Iowa? It's UCLA. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was a little bit of an odd, like why ruffle those feathers? If you're Kirk, like <laughs> you can bring things up and say there's examples out there, but why specifically call USC out? Um, I get the feeling that Kirk probably just doesn't like what USC has stood for for a long time. He probably doesn't like the fact that, you know, they're able to buy and sell quarterbacks 
probably doesn't like the fact that Lincoln Riley kind of abandoned OU, or at least that was the, there was no loyalty there, right? And a lot of OU fans kind of resented that. I don't know. I'm just kind of surmising that based on the comments, but um, Kirk, as, as always, defers to wins. You and I both agree it's going to be harder to win at this rate in the new Big Ten. And so if the standard is no longer like one thing Kirk said, what, which this is I thought this is interesting. I'm anxious to get your your take on it as well. But Kirk brought up how, you know, even though we're concerned about the new offensive coordinator, we're focused. I'm focused on the bowl game right now and how foolish it would be if I wasn't, because this is one of this. We have an opportunity to be one of just a few teams in Iowa history to, to win 11 games. He said that. And that's true. That's true. It's just, it's different. It's different winning 11 games now than it was even five years ago, I guess. Partially because the bowl games are so much different with player opt-outs and early draft and role, draftees and whatnot. Um, so that that's part of it. But it is still a significant accomplishment. I'm not trying to downplay it. Um, but, you know, one thing that I thought was interesting is it, the question was asked, is it guaranteed that Brian is going to be coaching in the bowl game? And the answer was no. Kirk said, well, if, if he gets a job, I would encourage him to pursue that. You know, he's got to think about himself first. Which I understand. I haven't given that necessarily deep thought. But I always hear about how the team comes first and everything. You know, I understand Brian has been let go. So he doesn't have any, he doesn't have to stick around. But if we're talking about the Iowa way and loyalty, there are circumstances where coaches stick around through the bowl game to coach even after being relieved of their duties. Am I correct? Yes. So I'm a little bit surprised by that answer, but there is clearly animosity from the parents camp toward the Iowa administration. I don't blame them for that necessarily, but, uh, and I would guess Brian will coach in the bowl game because I don't know of any NFL offers that he's got right now, but you never know. You don't blame Brian and Kirk for having animosity because of the way it was handled or because simply because Brian was fired because of the way it was handled. And I understand the perspective. I understand the Kirk Ferentz perspective. I've been here 23, 24 years. I should be able to hire my own coaches. I don't expect water to all of a sudden be thicker than blood. All right. I understand that this is a blind spot you're going to have when you bring on your son. And so it fall to me, it falls back to administration and enabling and everything that, that occurred. And it put Beth Getz and the administration in a difficult position. And then ultimately the president was the one that made the call for Beth Getz to fire Brian and to do so mid season was a bit of an odd choice, but I just have a hard time complaining about it. Cause it's a move that's been long overdue. Kirk Ferentz made a poor decision hiring his son. That's all there is to it. That was a poor decision. I don't know that I agree with that. I think the argument should be made that it was a poor decision to promote his son. Because would you say that it was a, a bad decision on the part of Jim Harbaugh to, to uh, hire his son? Well, it's not. Uh, you, you can make poor decisions that don't come to light. So you're saying the Harbaugh decision is possibly a poor decision? I know that I wouldn't hire my son in a public setting like that. You know, if, if I'm just running my hardware store down the street, then absolutely. But when I'm accountable to the people of an entire state as the highest paid employee in that state, there are plenty of places for him to coach football. And it's a public institution. We should have a different standard as it relates to nepotism. But the fact of the matter is, if Brian had succeeded here, no one would have cared. Sure. And it, it doesn't matter. And like if a guy, I'm all, I'm not for nepotism as it is constructed, all right, and interpreted. But if the best person for a job happens to be the relative of someone within said entity, I don't think the rules of nepotism or the unwritten rules of nepotism should prevent that individual from getting the job. Um, I don't think there's any question Brian was not the best candidate for the OC job. I think if he had stuck around and, and Jim Harbaugh's son has not been promoted to offensive de- or offensive or defensive coordinator. Now, maybe eventually he will. But I think if Brian were just coaching tight ends or Brian was just coaching the O-line or running backs, whatever the case may be, 
I'm guessing he's probably a pretty good position coach. So I don't think he'll have a hard time finding a job in the league. But it, the problem is you put yourself in a really precarious position. He just wasn't qualified, didn't have the qualifications, did not have the resume. Say what you want. And I think that's a little bit of a lack of discretion on Kirk's part. So I can understand his perspective. You know, if I'm trying to put myself in his shoes at his age with everything that's happened. But at the same time, I do not blame the university for making the decision that it made because it was the right decision, in my opinion. I also know enough about myself and about human nature in general to know that I wouldn't be able to most likely would not be able to fairly evaluate my son as an employee under me. Yeah, and that's part of the problem, right? And, you know, even the construction of university bylaws and policy was supposed to account for that, right? When you say, well, Brian reports to the AD. But the problem is, in all reality, he's not reporting to the AD. I mean, in all reality, you, you, Gary Barta did not handle the situation as he should have handled it. All right? And perhaps he should have said, Kirk, I don't think this is a good idea. And even though this is gonna, not going to be, this is not going to sit well with a lot of people who love you, I do not want to put this program in this position where you're elevating your son. We've, we've allowed you to hire him. And even as a position coach, he's been my responsibility as AD, but it's not time to promote him. And Gary Barta allowed that to happen. And so it is what it is. I don't know anybody how they can really blame Beth Getz for anything. She was told to make, she was pressured and told basically to make this move. She's also trying to vie for the job for the permanent AD title. And she was put in a miserable position by her predecessor, Gary Barta. Got uh, National Signing Day coverage at uh, from the Hawkeye of the Storm with Corey at 1 Central. So again, Wednesday afternoon, 1 Central with Corey. I'm going to fire it up at 9 a.m. And we've got a pretty good run of media that's going to drop by. Let's see here. So if any of you are interested in, and we're just going to, pretty much take in the national scene and get to as much news as possible. But in the meantime, starting at 10 a.m., we're hitting media members coming in from Virginia, Iowa. So Hawkeye fans, we got Elliot Clough joining us at 10.30 a.m. Eastern time. So 9.30 a.m. Central time over on the main channel. Ole Miss, South Carolina, Oklahoma State, Oregon, Wisconsin, Kentucky, Ohio State, uh, Washington, Florida State. Miami shows as well. So a lot going on in the main channel with National Signing Day. But if you want the concentrated look at Iowa, of course, Corey at uh, 1 p.m. Central time. Can we acknowledge John's comment in the chat here, Mark? Yes, of course. Which one would that be? I'll, I'll throw it up here. Uh, he says Michigan has Jay Harbaugh, but he's a great coach. Who says Brian Ferentz is not a great coach? He's not a great coordinator, but he has not been proven to be a bad coach or not, even not a great coach because – Th those positions that he coached at Iowa performed pretty well. And by the way, whether you want to attribute this to great personnel or great coaching, he was tight ends coach at New England during the monster year from Aaron Hernandez and Rob Gronkowski. So that's what my point, John, is he was not – we can't really evaluate Brian on his ability to coach a certain position because he was prom he was promoted way, way prematurely to a, a position that he was absolutely just not qualified. It'd be like you, it'd be like me, uh, Mark, uh, all of a sudden being promoted to host sports center on ESPN. Like, uh, you know, may, maybe people think I do a pretty good job on here, but I, I can guarantee you I would, that would be a disaster. And so that would be a disservice on, you know, my part on whoever promoted me on the viewers. And that's kind of what we have with, with Iowa football. I would tune in for it. <laughs> Well, I would tune in for if you was you on there too, but uh, I auditioned for it. Did you? I'll have to tell you that story sometime. We'll okay. we'll break into that story someday. All right, uh, appreciate y'all being here. I was asked to audition. I didn't come up with that idea. Anyway, appreciate y'all being here at the Voice of College Football and uh, our Iowa show that we do each and every Tuesday. We do have a super chat coming in. Erica, thank you so much. 
Erica says the double standard is crazy when it comes to the nepotism issue. Offensive coordinator Brian was horrific, but performance should not matter here. Nepotism is nepotism. So, so that's kind of like reverse nepotism, though, Erica. If you're saying you should never be able to hand, uh, hire a relative, what if he is literally qualified because of the work he's put in or whatever advantages? Everybody has advantages and disadvantages in life. Like, what if he is the ultimate? Like Marvin Harrison Jr. Where, 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 did, where did Marvin Harrison go to school? Syracuse. Okay. So say Syracuse had, had offered him a scholarship. Would that have been nepotism? I'm guessing Syracuse did offer him a scholarship. Is that right? If they didn't, they knew not to, but, <laughs> but you see, yeah, he yeah, got a hundred offers or whatever, some ridiculous number. Yes. It would be dumb of Syracuse not to offer one of the best receivers, like regardless of their last name, higher based on criteria. Sure. Yes. And, and that's why to your point, even though I would be a little bit more cautious about it to your point, Nothing wrong with hiring uh, a relative as long as they are qualified for the position and then they are being accurately and fairly evaluated. Yeah, and that's uh, very, you could argue that's almost impossible to do, right? Unless there's legitimate oversight. And when a guy has as much power as Kirk has had here for so long, it, it it was going to be near impossible, but, but Beth gets in this administration now prove that it isn't impossible, but you just wish that things hadn't gotten to this point. Corey, can we basically take the commitment list for 2024 and just basically rubber stamp it? That's what we're going to see tomorrow. As far as I'm aware, I'm, I'm and maybe Elliot, when he comes on tomorrow morning, uh, we'll be able to tell you differently, but I, I don't, I'm not aware of any, late flips. In fact, I'd have to count scholarship numbers. They, they are, unless they have somebody that would potentially be gray shirting that they add in late. Uh, last I knew Grant Laper was gray shirting from this past class. So uh, he's in need of a scholarship. He may be on scholarship now actually, but um, you know, th they just got Nick Young back. Uh, I'll be publishing a video here this evening about that. He announced here a few days ago that he's returning, which it's kind of funny. Some of the fans reactions to that, like, People just love to hate people like Nick DeYoung. It's just too bad because here's a guy who's going to be in his sixth season, you know, and he hasn't had the best career in the world, but like a guy who's like Nick DeYoung, who's been, who started like a dozen or two dozen games in his career, you're going to really say, you're going to really want him to move on. Who are they going to bring in in place of him? Like someone who's ready to take on that type of shouldering load. No, he's not been the best. He got exposed against Michigan in 2021. I think people are kind of hung over from what Jack Plum and Nick DeYoung did against Aiden Hutchinson and David Ojabo in 21. But he has been, he has, it's been stated very clearly on numerous occasions from Kirk Ferentz, who knows a heck of a lot more about offensive lines than any of us here in the chat, me, you, any of us. He has said Nick DeYoung is by far the most versatile guy they have. So I'm going to take a sixth year from Nick DeYoung. And I think the coaching staff is smart to have taken a sixth year. They were able to get him back, get that locked in early. They know that scholarship is, is taken up and now we'll wait decisions from um, people like Jay Higgins and uh, Sebastian Castro. Um, we're going to be getting an announcement. I think at some point from Cooper DeGene and Nick Jackson, we should hear if there's anything from the NCAA that was supposed to come down. I think this week, we should hear something this week on if Nick Jackson's even eligible to return uh, due to the Virginia situation. So we'll see. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys. You can only have so many scholarships, and they got a, a you know, a pretty good sized freshman class coming in as well. And a punter, and a punter. We ought to talk about the punter from uh, Australia. I, this, I'm telling you right now, I'm telling you right now, this. I know people don't like that. You want to make fun of Iowa fans for talking about punter. There's a reason he's coming in as a scholarship punter. Okay. Keep in mind, Drew Stevens was not offered a scholarship at a high school. They don't love to offer specialists at a high school. They rarely do it, but they learned from Tory Taylor. Um, now they paid the, they offered Ryan Gersande. He was a punter four or five years ago out of the U S he was at least a five-star punter. They offered him. He never really punted. He was a holder his whole time at Iowa, and they used a scholarship up on him. 
that's that kind of sucks. <laughs> like, that kind of sucks in hindsight. But like my point is, Lavar Woods was down in Australia, flew down this past week. He's from the he plays for the same program as uh, Tory Taylor did. I don't know if you saw the video. There's a couple of videos that have went viral of of him because you don't have a whole lot of information. Like none of the recruiting sites have anything on this kid. Um, you know, I, I don't even know that I've seen a rating on him formally. I think on three or rivals have him as like a zero star. They they don't know anything. It's it means absolutely zilch. They offered this kid a scholarship. He's got a big leg. There's a couple of videos out there of him booting the football. And I mean, it looks like it almost looks like a rocket taking out off his foot. Like, and they, they showed the stopwatch and, and I slowed it down to make sure that it wasn't, you know, altered in any way. It was a legitimate, it had to have been 55 plus yard kick. And it was in the air for almost six seconds. I mean, this thing just, <laughs> I, I haven't seen anything. It looks like it had helium in it. Maybe there was some helium. Maybe it was an inflate gate type of situation. Cause that thing just stuck in the air. So, you know, it, hey, it's important to what Iowa does, Mark. Say what you want about it. it it's, it's important to it's everyone. Excited about, yeah. It should be. It should be important to everyone. Uh, the special teams and especially the the punting is at the and and field goal kicking is at the crux of the special teams. Of course, that's the person that uh, has the the skill that the units built around is very important and for anyone that ignores it then you know i could have fed kirk if he's not aware i could have fed him a little bit more fodder for his comments about lincoln riley and he he would have been able to say and we also know that that program doesn't have a special teams coach <laughs> they don't have a special teams coach yeah and they're lousy on special teams can i um can i share this video of course, sure. I want you to see. I want you to see this video. I'm not. I, I'm really. I was not trying to uh, exaggerate this. So, j just watch this ball travel. And I know. I'm sure, Michigan fans will think this is just hilarious that I'm even <laughs> ooing and eyeing over a guy punting a football. But just, just watch this. This is real. This is again. Uh, Iowa commit, and he's going to be a signee here very soon. Uh, Reese. I believe it's pronounced Reese. I said Rise. See, I'm thinking of John Rice Plumley, but I believe it's actually pronounced Reese. I believe because it's an Australian name and British roots. I think. Well so done by me. you. Well, no, I, I'm not. I, somebody had to correct me. But um, all right, just just watch this. <laughs> oh my. God. 5.66 seconds. Mark. Yeah, it's tough to get perspective on how far that's being kicked, but it sure looks like it's <laughs> out there. Oh I just think that's insane. I, I just... <laughs> so what I've been told, and I, I, long before that video ever started going viral, um, I was told by someone who knows a little bit about this young man. He's got a big leg, maybe needs to work on accuracy a little bit, but boy, you can work with that type of a, a bomber's leg, especially when you have, you know, situate you, you've had a history. Hopefully the offense improves enough to where you're moving the ball more consistently and you can pooch upon a little bit more when, when necessary. Uh, obviously you don't want to punt ever, but the way Iowa plays, you're going to punt, but uh, boy, that, how many times do we see Tory Taylor during the last four years just make completely flip the field where you're punting almost out of your own end zone and all of a sudden the ball is at the minus 20? You know, I mean, it's just, it's incredible. And when you're able to, let's say in the span of a football game of punting six or seven times, be more effective by six, eight, 10 yards per punt exchange then you've just added very significant you've added 80 90 yards whatever the equation i just threw out there to your total offense figures and by the way this is the third straight kid out of this specific program in australia pro kick australia michael sleep dalton who was iowa's kicker prior to tory taylor had transferred in from arizona state he was also a product of 
this program. So they're going to keep hitting Australia hard because it seems like they produce right now the, the Australia produces the best punters. Um, and I think there used to be kind of this notion and, and perhaps it's because it was, it was factual that um, guys who were used to playing rugby, you know, had to rugby style punt. That doesn't seem to be, I mean, these, these kids are getting equipped for college football. Does it come from Australian rules football? Say that again. When I was a little tyke, we used to watch Australian rules football like in the middle of the night on ESPN. That was like one of their mainstay back before ESPN was a legitimate network that showed major league sports in the United States. You would see all sorts of crazy stuff. And Australian rules football was one of the sports. And it was basically just. I can't even describe it. It was some mixture of football, rugby, soccer. Guys would run around and they would boot the ball easily, like on the go, similar to what you see out of a uh, rugby style punter when they take the snap and they roll out and they kick it. That's how they would kick it. All I know is whatever type of football they're playing over there, they call gridiron. They call it gridiron, not football, gridiron. So... I thought that was interesting. Just listening to an interview with him. Uh, and I have just for the record, I'll, I'm not afraid to say I've tried to reach out to this young man, but it is like, see right now in Australia, I think it's like 5 AM. We're about 12 hours. Di- well, are we about 12 hours difference? I'm trying to think. Cause I know the only reason I know this is because uh, the Australian open, typically the morning starts in the evening. Yes. So, and it's one of my favorite Grand Slams because you can get up and you set my alarm at 3 a.m. and, you know, watch a night match, you know, that began at six o'clock their time or whatever. So. Yeah, I, I dreaded that time of year because when I worked at ESPN, we had the Australian Open. So with the shift that I typically worked, then that was kind of the oversight that I had. Oh, really? So you were you didn't like that? You like tennis. tennis. Tennis was never a good thing for anyone at a TV network because it's so unpredictable. The length of time is so unpredictable oh, yeah. of the matches. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's it's a little bit challenging to lock out time. I, what, one thing I will say, though, nobody's going to care. 144 people on here, nobody's going to care about what I'm about to say. I'm disappointed over the years that ESPN has dropped their coverage of non grand slams. Like they just don't, I don't even know that they have any non grand slams on ESPN anymore. They used to have Indian Wells, Miami. Um, they had Davis cup. They had oh, Davis all, the US, all the yeah. U S open series events. And now I think almost all those events are on. I, I don't even know what they're on, but basically ESPN's taken all the grand slams NBC. I don't think, I don't think ES, uh, NBC even has Wimbledon anymore for the weekends. Maybe CBS owns part of US Open, but um, anyways, that's that'd be my own my only quibble. I loved watching those, you know, matches in April in Indian Wells. So I didn't know you liked tennis. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I was a big Andy Roddick guy growing okay. up. So um, all right, once he re- once he retired, my interest level waned. Okay, and I'm gonna have a hard time once. I mean, we've seen Feder retire. Um, Once Nadal retires, I'm going to have a real hard time becoming real invested. But I love this young kid, Carlos Alcaraz. Like he's, he is something special to watch. And uh, I don't know. He's got, he's got a little bit of Rafa in him. That's similar to me and Jimmy Connors. Oh, and you know, Jimmy Connors. I was a big Jimmy Connors guy. Yeah. Jimmy Connors. Love Jimmy Connors. Jimmy Connors coached Andy Roddick for a a while for a stint. I remember that. So, uh, I started to lose interest maybe mid to late nineties, eh, maybe, maybe later than that, maybe more in the two thousands. Okay. Yeah. So like during the Sampras Agassi rivalry. Yeah. I used to watch those guys play a lot. Yeah. So even after that, I watched erotic play quite a bit. When did he pop on the scene? Well, he won the, he, he won the U S open in 03 and it was his only major okay. win. Had a lot again, of uh, had a lot of final final appearances against Roger, but he unfortunately the two eras aligned almost mm-hmm. 
almost spot on with each other. And it just, it cost Roddick probably four or five majors at the minimum. Yeah. Working where I worked, uh, even if I lost interest in a sport, I couldn't get away from it. So it kept me very informed on what was going on for sure. Well, I think we've hit that magic time and we have certainly done national signing day justice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to be doing it all day tomorrow. So, um, I, I do think it's ironic that you're the headline. I don't make the headlines. Mark makes the headlines. National Signing Day preview. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and we really broke it down here. Hey, we talked about the punter who will be signing. We did talk about the punter. Uh, I can run through. I mean, they've got some good prospects. A lot of four upper three-star, low four-star kids. They don't have a Caden Proctor in this class. But uh, or a Xavier Wampa, but they got a lot of solid prospects, some small town kids that I'm pretty high on. I'm high on Brevin Dahl, who broke his leg this past year running back. Uh, hopefully he'll be full strength when he gets to to uh, Iowa City. They got a couple of kids. They got a kid from Williamsburg who's really, really good. Um, you know, they got small town guys everywhere, as they always do. And then they added a few guys. You know, we got uh, Devin Kennedy from down in the Phoenix area, defensive end, really physical, really athletic. Chima Ch uh, Chinake out of Plano East. Uh, another really raw guy at defensive end. And, um, you know, unfortunately, Iowa lost Ontario Thompson to the transfer portal here a week or two ago. So they've got some holes to fill on the defensive line. They're going to be losing Noah Shannon, losing J uh, Joe Evans. So some of these guys could play early. Brian Allen will be back for another year. But uh, good prospects and, and, once again, some good kids in this class. I will change the title of the video. We will go with something playing off of the Kirk Ferentz comments. Okay. <laughs> it's probably the most meat that we delivered. Uh, I will be here for four hours tomorrow over on my channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm from 4 to 5 p.m. Central Time, approximately. I might finish a little bit early if we get through all our, our uh, signees. We're going to have a buttload of players joining live. So a lot of people that we haven't heard from so if people don't have their notifications turned on or maybe you're going to be at work, you know, have it on in the corner of the room or on your phone, just listen to it with, with YouTube, whatever the case may be. And it'll be podcasted later for audio listeners, just like this show will be. But uh, it should be a fun day. It's always the longest. I shouldn't say always the longest stream. We had a couple of four hour streams and post game coverage this year. Isn't that just insane? But um, it is typically the longest stream of the year for me. Well, it is not the longest stream for me, but it's up no. there because uh, we got the 24 hour one, but uh, <laughs> we'll probably be on from nine to three. So we'll do six hours there. Then we've got uh, Steve Dace. Uh, so we're going to do maybe 45 minutes on Bama, Michigan with Mr. Dace. And then uh, I still am looking to line up some people, but um, then we'll do our Florida State Miami shows on Wednesday evening. All right, folks, appreciate you being here again, uh, 1 p.m. Central Time with Corey. Uh, for you Iowa fans, you get the best and the deepest dive on the national signing class and uh, all those interviews lined up. Great stuff. If you want more of the national variety, I'll be around all day over on the main channel. Corey, have a great uh, national signing day. Um, I'm sure your stream will be phenomenal, and uh, we will see you soon. Okay, Mark. Thank you.